out there in podcast land. Welcome to the Lucius McDowell Living Right Podcast. Tonight, I'm excited to greet you with the words of the Lord. I'm excited to be here to be alive. I'm telling you, it's so wonderful to see at the end of the year, that, you know, that God keeps keeping us through all of the situations that we have been faced with throughout our journey. Well, I want you to know that tonight we're going to jump into the Word of God as it pertains to living right. We'll be uh, talking to you again about a continued subject matter entitled Walking in the Spirit, Cultivating the Fruit of the Spirit. Time tonight we're going to deal with the last three, and that is faith, that is meekness, and that is temperance. And I really believe that we'll get it taken care of so that we would have completed the entire series of teaching on walking in the Spirit and cultivating the fruit of the the, the, walking in the Spirit, cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. Praise the name of the Lord. As we uh, examine all of these nine fruits, we recognize that, you know, they're all vitally important in our life, and as a result of it, we got to make sure that we get where we need to be so that there can be evidence of anyone eating off of your tree, that they will be blessed by it. So anybody eating anything from my tree, I want them to always enjoy love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meekness, and temperance. Let me tell you something. When they taste those things from my tree, I want them to say, mmm, that's good stuff, good stuff. He's been walking with God. He's been nurturing. He's been cultivating. He's been doing the things that need to be done. And I'll challenge you tonight to do the very same thing because it's vitally important that in this day and hour that we do see people whose light are shining. Jesus is the light. We are the light. Come on now. Jesus is the light of the world. We're supposed to be shining so that others can see the light on the inside of us. So over in Second Timothy, the third chapter, the 16th through the 17th verse, the scripture says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man or woman, that the man of God may be perfect, Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I say this every time I have a broadcast. We want to be definitely, uh, we want to be matured. We want to be perfected. We want to be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And I tell you, everybody is not walking that way because a lot of people are walking away from the Word of God. Anytime you walk away from what the Word of the Lord is saying, what you're saying, I'm walking in rebellion. I'm walking against it. And God didn't want you to walk against it. He wants you to walk together with Him. Amos 3 and 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Where there is unity, there is strength, there is power. Where there is unity, there is an ability for God to uh, actually do the great things that he wants to do in the earth. So over in Proverbs, the fourth chapter, starting with the seventh verse, I'll go there right quickly. It says, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting and Get understanding. That means that we have a responsibility to get understanding concerning every element of the instructions of our God. The Word of God has been put into a a place that we'll be able to always go back in and make sure that we can nurture, nurture our relationships, grow in God, grow in grace, grow in His Word so that our minds can be renewed daily and we're able to actually win in our everyday lifestyle. So again, tonight we're talking about walking in the Spirit, cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. We've been dealing with a bunch of the fruits of the Spirit. We've been dealing with not all nine, but we've been dealing with almost six of them. And tonight we're going to try to kind of do a crash course because we know that on next week it's going to be Christmas Day and on the next week it's going to be New Year's Day. So that we're going to try to get it all out of the way. So when we come back in the new year, we'll be coming at you with some fresh, 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 fresh things to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. So we want you to continue to be empowered with the Lucius McDowell Living Right Podcast. We want to just say to you 
And if you ever want to get in contact with us, feel free to reach us at the luciusmcdowell.com. And that way you'll be able to access my ministry page. If there's any request or desires that you have for me that you want me to speak, you want me to sing, I got all my music videos, I got everything there. All of my music is on all digital platforms. Music that will bless you, it will edify you, it will keep you moving, it will minister to wherever you are concerning your walk of life. And also, you can always join us every Sunday morning uh, at the Agape International Ministry broadcast, which is at Agape International Ministry, Hampton, Georgia. We are on at 945, and boy, you're talking about a power time of the Lord. You don't want to miss it. And because we own the World Wide Web, you can catch us when you can. So if you can get catch us at 9.45, you can catch us anytime you want to because you can always go back and replay our services. But don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like, and definitely don't forget to share it. Amen. So let's jump into the Word of God. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, starting with verse number 16, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Tells you, give you a command to walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Notice it did not say corral the flesh and then try to walk. No, it gives you the instructions of walking first in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Because the the flesh lusts is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But verse eighteen says, "But if you be led of the spirit." Ye are not under the law. I want to jump down because verse 19, it lists all the works of the flesh, which I'm not focusing on tonight because that's another teaching some other time later down the road. But on verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the love. That means with the nerves that go with all of those things that try to agitate your spirit, your your flesh to get you to a place to walk against the will of the Father. But verse 25 says it so perfectly. It says, if you live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Why? Because God wants each of his children to produce fruit. The fruit of the spirit is so much better than the flesh. I like this because, you know, the word of the Lord teaches us that the lips of the righteous will feed many. So tonight I want to be able to feed you, feed you, feed you the word of God so that you'll be able to grab hold of everything that we're talking about. The word fruit is very important. Uh, there are There is not fruit without a seed. A fruit is a result of a seed, and we always said that each uh, seed produces after its own kind. I want you to understand that God's divine seed came into our spirit by that of the Holy Spirit. We received a spiritual deposit the minute that we call Jesus Lord of our life. And that seed was planted in us was the life of God. In other words, the DNA of God and the power of God just waiting to produce in our life. Now, if we yield to it, we will, we will begin to produce supernatural fruits in our lives. And that fruit, supernatural fruit in our lives will give us the edge to win. It will give us the edge to win all the time because every time we begin to examine the Word of God, we can begin to look at our own self to make sure that we are lining our behavior up just as God would have us to line our behavior up. Now, we dealt with, uh, I think, goodness and kindness. Well, goodness was my last one that I did. My daughter did, uh, I think, kindness and long-suffering. But we are now going to jump into faith. The fruit of faith, the fruit of faith. Now, the moment you receive Jesus as your Savior, by faith, God sowed his spirit and word into your heart like the seed. And like we said earlier, just like apples always produce apples and oranges always produce oranges, God's seeds inside of you began to immediately produce God-like character on the inside of you. The minute that I became born again, I began to what develop the... The, the, the character of God on the inside, but that character is not going to be stirred, developed until I cultivate it. That means I got to go back and do some things myself. God gives it to us, but he expects for us to stir those things up so that we're able to see the increase. Remember, he gives you a seed of faith, 
got the, uh, you got faith the size of a mustard seed, but it's going to be left up to you to really build your faith, build that faith level. It's just like it's with the faith level, it's with the rest of the nine fruit of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Therefore, you should expect your life to yield the fruits of the Spirit for that. This is the seed of God has grown that was sown in your heart. And I am so grateful to God that I'm seeing the seed being grown and sown in my heart. Let me tell y'all something. Last week, I was just worn out because... Man, let me tell you something. I was teaching on goodness and talking about doing kindness, doing, being uh, gracious to people. I gave away so much stuff, but I praise the Lord. Every opportunity that the Holy Spirit spoke to me to be a blessing, I was a blessing as much as I remember. Glory to God. But I thank God for the teaching because it reminded me that, you know, you got to do more. You got to do more than just be the believer. You got to really develop that fruit. And you know, my mom always say, love is what it does. If you ain't doing nothing, your love is not being activated the way that it needs to be activated. So tonight we're going to jump into faith. And tonight we're going to go back and read uh, Galatians, the fifth chapter, the 22nd, the 23rd verse. I'm reading for the New King James Version. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, gratefulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. Now, the word faith is the Greek word pistis, which is the common New Testament word for faith. However, in this verse, it conveys the idea of a person who is faithful, reliable, loyal, and steadfast. Now, you can begin to measure yourself right now just by those four words. Are you faithful? Are you reliable? Are you loyal? Are you steadfast? It pictures a person who is devoted, trustworthy dependable, dedicated, constant, and unwavering. Let me tell you something about faith. You've got to be single-minded when it comes to the things of faith. You know, you can't be double-minded. You've got to make sure that, you know, if any man uh, has any doubt, he'll be just like to see. He would never be able to get anything from God, according to James Epistle. We want to make sure that we are not being unstable, but we are stable. We are unwavered. Amen. This, of course, is contrary to the flesh, which seeks to be lazy, uncommitted, undependable, and completely unreliable. Out of control. I'll say it that way. Now, when Paul wrote to Timothy and told him how to choose leaders, he urged Timothy to choose faithful men. This is also the word pistis, which tells us that it is mandatory for this fruit of the Spirit to be found in your leadership. Let me tell you something. You can't find the fruit of, of, of faithfulness in your leadership. They don't need to be leading. And I really believe that every pastor, every CEO needs to always go back and readjust and reevaluate to make sure that they're able to see exactly where their people really are. Praise the Lord. In fact, it is also used in, uh, in, in, in by Paul in 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, the second verse, where he writes, he says, Moreover, it is required in, it, is, it is required that a man be found devoted, trustworthy, dependable, dedicated, constant, and unwavering. This is really, uh, uh, Paul talks about being a faithful steward here, and we, we got to understand that, you know, there must be a moment where you get to the place where you are trustworthy, you're dependable, you're dedicated, you're constant, you're unwavering. Over in Matthew, the 25th chapter, the 14th through the 15th verse, the word of the Lord reads, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey, and straightway took his journey. But they had to be faithful. They had to be faithful over that which God had given them. Praise God. Now, I want to jump right on into this again because the faith or faith for this uh, this faith or faithfulness is so esteemed by God that it is listed in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where Paul writes, And now abide in faith, hope, charity. Well, this is where our theme of our church come from, Agape International Ministry. It says, This fruit of the Spirit is a part of the eternal nature of God. The Bible stresses that God is faithful and, early de- and utterly dependable. You can always depend on God. Because he's always 
right on time. He never come when you want him, but he always comes right on time. Numbers, the 23rd chapter, the 19th verse, it reads and says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither a son of man that he should change his mind or that he should repent. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And we must recognize that because he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, that he is faithful, true to his word. He's unchanging. Glory to God. If this unchanging, constant, stable, unwavering behavior is the nature of God himself, it shouldn't surprise us that when the Holy Spirit is allowed to freely work through our lives, he makes us faithful and steadfast just like God. But we have to what? Get in agreement with what the Holy Spirit is doing. Now, God is faithful. Therefore, we should expect faithfulness to grow in our lives as one of the fruit of the Spirit, one of the fruit of the Spirit. Faithfulness is steadfast, constancy, or a, 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 a allegiance. It is a, a carefulness in keeping what we are entrusted with. It is the conviction that the Scriptures are accurately reflective reality, and it's a biblical faithfulness requires belief in what the Bible says about God and His existence, His work, and His character. Faithfulness, what is the fruit of the spirit? Is one of the fruit of the spirit? It is the result of the Spirit working in us. But the Spirit is also our seal of faithfulness. He is our witness to God's promise that if we accept the truth about God, He will deliver us. And if we accept the truth about God, He will deliver. Now, over in Hebrews 11, it gives a long list of faithful men and women in the Old Testament who trusted God with all of their heart. And God talks about Abel's understanding of God made his sacrifice real and authentic. Noah trusted in God when God told him of the coming judgment as well as God promised to save his family. He built an ark because the rain was coming. Nobody believed in the rain because nobody had never heard of rain. But when you hear from God, you have to move by faith to to receive that which God is saying that is going to happen. Not only that, but, you know, talk about Abraham and Sarah. They believed against all evidence that they would have a child, and they end up having a child. Although Sarah ends up trying to help God out with that whole scenario and kind of mess the things up, but God made good on his promise. Even Rahab, she trusted God to protect her family when the Israelites destroyed Jericho over in Joshua, the sixth chapter. Now, let me say this to you. In that list in Hebrews 11 is an example of Enoch who obtained a witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And the scripture says, and without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I wonder, do we have any diligent seekers out there tonight? I'm a diligent seeker of the Lord. Let me tell you something. I've learned how to get out of my, get out of my own way and allow God to just lead me. You know, there's a scripture over in Proverbs, the third chapter, that says, trust in the Lord, starting with the fifth uh, verse. Trust in the Lord with all that heart and lean not to thy own understanding. I would just like to say when you're walking by faith and you're developing the fruit of faith, you've got to get your head space cleared with the Word of God. In fact, your mind must be renewed because the realities of what you're seeing sometimes does not always agree with what God is saying. But we know that we got to get in agreement with what he is saying in order for us to see it, praise the Lord. Because if we get in agreement with what he's saying, we will see it. That's, that's the reason why he always tells us we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. See, faith or faithful commitment to who God to who God says he is is basic is a basic to willing to walk with God regardless of the circumstance or the situation. As Jesus traveled, he responded to people's faith and he curtailed his involvement where there was no faith. In other words, when he recognized where people were not operating in faith, 
He was like, okay, only those that, you know, believe. They're going to be the ones that are going to get the blessing. For those who are not believers, it's going to be very difficult for them to receive. I'm going to read over his example in Mark the 6th chapter because it's a very good example of that. I'm going to start at the very first verse. It says, and he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, from him, from him, which had this man these things, and what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hand? It's not the this the carpenter, the son, the, the, the son of Mary, the, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended by him. But Jesus said unto them. A prophet is not without honor. You notice that little Jesus trying to stir up that unbelief. But Jesus came back and said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. My goodness, that preaches all by itself. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folks and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went around, I and mean, he went, went round about the villages teaching. So he was only able to really bless those individuals who had faith in God. Not faith in him, but faith in God. Now, getting back to Enoch, because Enoch was one who actually, uh, he obtained a witness that before he was taken up, he wanted to please God in everything that he did. Enoch understood that God reward those who seek him and trust him with all their heart. So we must trust what God does because we trust him, not the other way around. In other words, we trust God even when he is silent and we see no miracles. We don't see absolutely anything because one of the things that we got to understand is that it's still of faithfulness on our part. We have to stay in faith. We know God is reliable. We know that he is steadfast, and we know that he is true. I'll say it again. God is reliable. He is steadfast, and he definitely is true to his word. Now, over in the Old Testament, saints also had faith in the invisible work of God. Over in Hebrews 11, chapter the third verse, Abraham never saw his descendants become as numerous as the stars in the sky. Remembering that God said his family, would, he would have such a great family, it would be so many stars that he wouldn't be able to even number them. Moses never entered the promised land. And none of the Old Testament saints lived to see the Messiah, glory, that Messiah. But they were faithful. They believed God would do as he promised. And tonight I'm just asking you, do you believe that God is going to do as he promised? Do you believe that God is going to do exactly what he said he would do? Because once you once you get into that place of believing, your faith is strong. But when you do the opposite of belief, that means that fear sets in. The Bible teaches us that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and of a sound mind. The faithfulness is believing that God is who he said he is and continuing in that belief in spite of whatever is going on in your life. So functionally, that means we trust God's word. We trust what he says in the Bible and not necessarily what the world or our own eyes are telling us because we're going to always see the opposite. And guess what? The enemy is going to always remind you what's not working. But you got to understand that the word of God, it still works. So we must trust he will work out everything for our good. We must trust that he will work his will in us. And we must trust that our situation is not to ever be compared to our future because God will always turn things around for those who stay over into that realm of faith. Now, the only way we can have such faith is by the Holy Spirit's influence. He testifies to the truth and impels us to seek God the more and more. And the Spirit makes us faithful. But guess what? We have to desire to grow in our faith by building our faith with the Word of God, building our faith with confession, building our faith by making melodies in our hearts to the Lord. There are a lot of things that you can do. Carry down strongholds, all those areas that will try to stop you from really walking into what God has promised you. Let me tell you something. you got to build your faith and starve your doubts. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Well, the next one of the fruit that we would examine is the fruit of meekness. Um, few people think of meekness as a desirable attribute, but most assume that if a person is meek, he must be weak. Isn't that interesting? If you meek, you must be weak. Not so, says the Lord. To these people, a meek person is one who is timid, shy, bashful, or perhaps introverted. But this is grossly incorrect view of the New Testament word for meekness. In actuality, meekness is one of the strongest attributes a person can possess. The word meekness in Galatians, the fifth chapter, the 23rd verse, comes from the Greek word phratus, which depicts the attitude or dominion of a person who is forbearing, patient, and slow to respond in anger. Glory to God. I'll say it one more time. Uh, it, it depicts the attitude of, or demeanor of a person who is forbearing, patient, and slow to respond in anger. In pictures, a strong-willed person who has learned to submit his will to a higher authority. And that's a big issue because a lot of people cannot submit to any authority. Now, he isn't weak. He is controlled. He may, in fact, possess a strong will and a powerful character. But this person has learned the secret of how to bring his will under control. Now, I ask that question because, you know, we live in a day and hour where people don't like for people to give them orders. We live in a day and hour where people don't like to tell them what to do. We live in a day and hour where people will rub you the wrong way in a minute. And if you're not careful, it's easily to be what we call quick-tempered and loose tongue and say things that, you know, to get them off of you and make sure that they understand that you're not a pushover. Here, that's not what God is saying. He's saying a meek spirit is a person who's the meaner person who is forbearing, patient, and slow to respond in anger. Oh, my goodness. Boy, this word is working us. It's working us over because what it's telling us is we got a lot of work to complete. We got a lot of work to complete as the Holy Spirit is there waiting to produce after his own kind. So we're going to look at it again because meekness has to do with the attitude or the demeanor of a person who can control his temper or his emotions. When meekness is being produced in you by the Holy Ghost, it will make you careful and control it. I'll tell you in a minute, be quiet. Don't say nothing. Boy, I tell you, I had an experience this over the weekend, and I tell you, someone had done something that I had not forgotten. I forgiven them, but the minute I saw them, it brought it back to my attention. And boy, let me tell you something. I just wanted to just go off the opposite way, but the Holy Spirit would not allow me to. The person began to speak, and they, they began a conversation. They intentionally had a conversation. I and mean, I guess they were going to see that I'm going to be going back to them. But guess what? I was very cordial. I could have said, I don't want to speak to you. I don't want to deal with you because of what happened. But the reality is Holy Spirit had me have the conversation with them as we were walking into a building. I was like, oh, my goodness. The Holy Spirit is at work doing what he needs to do because this was something that really rubbed me the wrong way. Now, it's been some years ago, but it just brought it all, the flesh just brought it, the enemy brought it all back as if it had just happened. I'm just letting you know that you got to always go back over the Word of God. You got to go all, you got to always go back and make sure that you are, are rehearsing the Word of God in your spirit because if you don't, it is so easy to respond in your flesh. It is very easy to respond in your flesh. Now, meekness, again, does not mean that you're weak. Rather, it involves humility and thankfulness toward God. It's polite. It's restrained behavior toward other people. And the opposite of gentleness is, the opposites of gentleness uh, or meekness or, or anger, a desire for revenge or self uh, 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 arrangements you can go back and, and get you know get 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 back at people and that's not the way that God wants it to be. It takes a strong person to be truly gentle, and I want you to understand that we have to practice this. We have to practice, and we have to be reminded all the time, all the time, all the time. 
You got one us to, to give him control of our lives, relying on, not on our logic, not on our reason, but we want to rely on the Holy Spirit's leading. And with the wisdom given to us by the Holy Spirit, we begin to see why we should completely submit to God as the Lord of our lives. And I'm going to tell you something, when you do that every time, it just takes you higher and higher and higher and higher. And let me tell you something, as you get more into the Word concerning how you're supposed to be walking, how you're supposed to be living, guess what's going to happen? You are going to be challenged. When I say you're going to be challenged, you're going to be challenged all of the time. So we got to make up in our mind, are we going to cultivate the fruit, or are we going to just allow our flesh to just uh, lead us and guide us and get us in trouble? I don't want to get in trouble, no more than when I have to get in trouble. I have to go before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me for not responding the way I was supposed to respond. But even as I'm given another opportunity, guess what? I must pass the test. And you will take the test over and over and over again. And you'll take the test through a series of people. You'll be surprised of the people that God will send you with till you really get it, 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 get it. So I made up in my mind that I don't want retake. So I'm going to try to do my very best to be cognizant of the fact of how I roll with people, with God's people, even with the people of the world, because they need to see Christ in us so that they will want what we have. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. So that is the the area of of meekness. Meekness has to do with your attitude or your demeanor of a person who can control his temper. Glory to God. Now, let's look at the word temperance. The word temperance comes from the Greek word in and kratos. The word in means in, and the word kratos in the Greek word is power. When you combine, when combined into one word, these two Greek words form the word ekrasia, which literally means in control and denotes power over one's own self. It denotes power over one's own self. Wow. It denotes power over one's own self. I like it again. I'm going to say it denotes power over one's own self, it suggests the control or restraint of one's passion, appetite, and desires. Uh, I'll say it again. It, it denotes self-control, um, restraint of one's passions, appetite, and desire. In other words, I'm not going to lose my cool. I'm not going to go and do some things that is going to cause me and get me to a place that is not good. Just as meek individuals can control his attitude, a person with temperance has power over his appetite, his physical urges, his passions and desires. Because the Holy Spirit has produced temperance in his life, he is able to say no to overeating, uh No to overindulging in fleshly activities. No to any excess in the physical realm. You know, I had a conversation with someone this week, and they were telling me, you know, they don't eat uh, sweets. They don't. uh, They drink water. They exercise all the time, and they told me that. But you know, my problem I had is I drink. I was like, wow. Well, you probably if you you know have already over your, your appetites and all that, you should be able to, you know cut that other piece out. And he told me, well, uh, I struggle with that, man. I struggle with that. And I said, wow, you mean to tell me that you can exercise authority over, you know, sweets and, you know, not drinking all the stuff, you know, but this, when it comes to, to alcohol, you can't seem to kick that happen. And he's like, you know, I got to really, really work in that area. And all he needs is temperance to work. Temperance can go to work for him because here we go is a person with temperance maintains a life of moderation and control. They get they stay away from overindulging in fleshy activities. They a way to they have a way of, of no to any excuses in the physical realm. A person with the temperance maintains a life of moderation and control. The word uh, the word in, in Christian temperance could be thus translated a restraint, moderation, discipline, balance, temperance, or self-control. And you can see how the opposite temperance is to the work of the flesh. If the flesh is allowed to have its way, 
it will over worry, overwork, overeat, overindulge, and literally run itself to death. But when a person is controlled by the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit produces in him a discipline over the physical realm that helps him sustain his physical condition, stay in good health, remain free from sin, and live a life that is moderate and a life that is balanced. Glory to God. So that means that you can see these these fruit are working hand in hand. I mean, they're working together, and it's so awesome that, you know, even as they're working hand in hand, we've got to go back and make sure that we are we are we're cultivating them and if they're being cultivated we're in a situation where we are now allowing the flesh to take total control of our being we're not allowing the, the flesh to take total control of our being but we're doing those things that supposed to be done are according to the word of god i'm going back to galatians the fifth chapter again starting with the 16 verse it says this i say then Walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Because the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But he says, but if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now check this out. Now look at the walk, the works of the flesh. Verse 19 says, now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, and revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In verse number 22 again, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, again, love. It's joy. It's peace. It's long-suffering. It's gentleness. It's goodness. It's faith. It's meekness. It's temperance. Against us there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the authority affections, and the lust. Man, oh man, oh man, oh man. But that means that you're being Christ, you are what? You have you have crucified. You put it to death, you know, the flesh, with the affections and lust. And it goes and says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now, I want to go back and kind of clarify this piece here because one of the things I want us to get here is, it goes on and says, you know, the the in, in the text of Galatians 5, 24, Paul is saying that the flesh has been executed. But how could that be in light of what he was just said in, the, in, in this chapter about believers having a constant war with the ever-present flesh? In what sense is the flesh killed at conversion? It cannot be the actual complete present tense, or it would contradict the reality of the continual spiritual conflict with, with the with the flesh indicated here over in Romans the seventh chapter uh, from verse fourteen through twenty, and it cannot and it is it cannot be that Paul has some future sense in mind of or he would have used a future verb form saying shall crucify the flesh, referring to the times of glorification. The best understanding is to see have crucified as an illusion of the cross of Jesus Christ, which, as a past event, fits the tense used here by Paul. It looks back to the cross, the time at which the death of the flesh was actually accomplished. Yet, because we are still alive on the earth and still possess our humanity, humanness, I'm sorry, we have not yet entered into the future fullness of that past event. Meanwhile, the flesh with its passions or affections, affections and desires is dead in the sense of no longer reigning over us or holding us in inescapable bondage. We're no longer in bondage. I like this example that I, I was able to read. It's like a chicken with its head cut off. The flesh has been dealt a death blow, although it continues to flop around the barnyard of earth until the last nerve is thrown. 
So until the last nerve is strolled, that means that you got to kill it. you got to mortify it. you got to make sure that it doesn't rise up because the flesh is defeated forever. And we are now, we are now alive in the realm of where Christ reigns over us by his spirit. We should live according to the spirit and not according to the flesh because believers have a new life in Jesus Christ. They should also have a new way of living uh, through Jesus Christ. If we live by the Spirit, and we do, Paul says, let us walk by the Spirit as we must. He earnestly prayed that, you know, this is a prayer that all of the believers, all the Christians should be walking so that, you know what, that others that are looking at us can see that we are rooted and grounded. We are really firmly furnished in the Word of God, in the things of God, and we will continue completely do the necessary things that God is telling us to do through our words. I'm just telling you, I'm going to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to do what i got to do. I'm going to get word in me. And if I recognize where there is a fleshly trip up, I'm going to purposely get up, repent, and I'm going to make good of the very thing that I'm supposed to be doing. Because I truly believe that, you know, that's going to be our key to winning. That's going to be our key to winning by walking in the Spirit of the Lord. By walking in the Spirit of the Lord. Going back to it again, Galatians 5, 16, it says, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh because there's going to be a war going on and it's certainly going to be there to trip you up to stop you from doing the very things that god has called for you to do god want to use you and god want to he wants to bring you on a uh, on a larger platform he want to really be able to get you to a place where your life is an example for the world to see and i really believe that this is the day that we live in that you know it's time because gross darkness is all over the world and and now gross darkness has got on the people. And guess what? Some of the gross darkness has even got on some of the people of God. But we've got to make up in our mind that we will not allow ourselves to continue to walk in sin. We will not allow ourselves to continue to be dominated by our flesh because the flesh, it needs to be, have to be crucified. And if it's not crucified, it will do whatever it can to get you over to a place where you will not win as God would like for you to win. And I think this is an opportunity, again, for us to realize that this is our day, this is our hour, and we got to get to this place where we are doing exactly what it is that God is telling us to do. So there might be people out there tonight who have had some struggles here, have had some struggles there, but I want to bring you to uh, the Word of the Lord. If you're born again, believer, let me tell you something. This is a way to go ahead and repent of it and get back up and start moving again. But this time when you move, build yourself up by faith. Build yourself up in the Word. Get you some good reading material that's going to encourage you. You know, wisdom is the principal thing, and all about getting, get understanding. This thing is really real. You just can't wait to hear somebody say it. you got to go be young. And when I'm listening, when I'm building faith and starving down, I might receive a word of the Lord, but you better bet I'm going to go deeper because I want to know what is it going to take for me to really win. I know me, and because I know me, I know what I need. And it should be the same thing that you should go to God, you got, you got, you got what I need. Glory to God. And God will give you everything that you need because it's already there in his word. First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, all right, let me go to verse number eight. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's what I always laugh at people when they, you know, look like me. It's time to repent. Nobody say nothing. Like, okay, come on now. You got to have something going on in you that is not right. So if all of you is all right with God right now, that means that you got up this morning, you said a really good prayer. But verse number nine says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our responsibility to get before the Lord every day, our responsibility to make sure that, you know, we're acknowledging things when they're not going the way they should go. Our responsibility is to make sure that we examine ourselves in the perfect law of liberty and so much so that, you know, we can uh, move and become just like him. And I really believe that when we uh, build our faith, start our doubts, and I believe that we start seeing the fruit of it all, it should be motivation to you that you must keep going because let me tell you, 
when I can see my love walk walking and then I can see my joy working and I can see my peace working and I can see my long suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance, I feel like I am growing. And guess what? I might not be where I need to be, but I am a work in progress. I am progressing. I am moving toward making the necessary the necessary changes that need to be made in my life. So listen, tonight, as I end the show, I just want to let you know that this is the opportunity for you to come on in to God and say, look, I want to be better. I got to do better. I, 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 want to, I want to get to this place where I'm examining me. I'm not allowing myself to continue to operate in the realm that I used to. The word says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are brand new because it's brand new. I'm brand new, and I got a brand new attitude, and I have renewed my mind, and because I renewed my mind, it is my desire to please you in everything that I say and do. Now listen, if we leave tonight, I just want you to know that this is an opportunity for you to go before the Lord and examine yourself. Go through not all nine of the fruits, but you can go back and deal with the reality of Everywhere that you need to make the improvement, bring it up, 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 and begin to get that word so that you can be strong. Not only that you can be strong, that you can help others see what God is doing in your life. Let me tell you something. And all about getting, get understanding and living right. You got to do this thing while we're walking in there. Praise God. If we do this, we believe that, you know, during the holiday season, what an opportunity for your fruit to be working when you get around all the brothers and glory stuff. Even going into the new year, what an opportunity for the fruit to be working so that you can walk into your newness. I am going to a new season. I'm talking about the new era, E-R-A. It's longer than a season, so that means that God has some great things in store for you. And even as you have those things in store for you, go, 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 go. Get it. Align yourself with the Word of God so that you can be who God has called you to be. God bless you. And we will see you again on Monday. Same time, same place on the Lucius McDowell Living Ride Podcast. Glory to God. Merry Christmas.